All right, church. Well, let's go ahead and grab our Bibles, iPhones, iPads, whatever you got that you can turn to Hosea. We're in chapter 8. I'm actually really surprised at how fast we've been moving through this. And I thought to myself, we should slow down a little bit. This is, this is too fast. But today we're in Hosea chapter 8. I'd love to remind us that the church is not a group of people joined together because we have similar interests or because we have similar backgrounds, but the church is the people of Christ joined together in and through Jesus Christ. And so he's the reason why we gather together to encourage one another, to build one another up. And so we gather together on the weekend to proclaim the word of God to one another that we might be changed and transformed by the work of God. And so today, turning to Hosea chapter 8, which None of you, one of you, thank you, Mark, has looked up in your Bibles. And uh, starting in chapter 8, verse 1, the prophet Hosea says this. Put the ram's horn to your mouth. One like an eagle comes against the house of the Lord because they transgress my covenant and rebel against my law. Israel cries out to me, my God, we know you. But Israel has rejected what is good. An enemy will pursue him. The word of the Lord Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Today, we're going to talk about humanity's hopelessness and uh, heaven's hope. Humanity's hopelessness, heaven's hope. In the book, The Source of Life, there's a 20th century theologian by the name of Jürgen Moltmann. And Jürgen Moltmann recounts his uh, events of what happened in, in World War II. He was actually a German soldier during the time of World War II, and he finds himself in a prisoner of war camp from the years 1945 to 1948. Moltmann struggles with this question of why did we survive? Why did I survive? He struggles with survivor's guilt, and he describes his fellow prisoner's struggle in this way in his book, The Source of Life. He says, most people were face to face with nothing and didn't know where to go. We had escaped, but we had lost all hope. Some of us had become cynical. Some fell ill. The thought of there being no way out was like an iron band constricting our hearts. And each of us tried to conceal his stricken heart behind an armor of untouchability. It was here during this time that he was a prisoner of war that somebody silently went into one of the huts and hung up pictures from a few of the camps, from Auschwitz. And he looked at these pictures with horror as he and his fellow prisoners were trying to make sense of what happened in this moment. It was during this time that he read the Psalms of Lament and he read the story of Christ. He recalls this moment in this way, this early fellowship with Jesus, the brother in suffering and the redeemer from guilt has never left me since. I never decided for Jesus, as is often demanded for us, but I'm sure that then and there, in the dark pit of my soul, he found me. Christ, God forsaken, showed me where God is, where he had been with me in my life, and where he would be in the future. And so you can imagine what it's like, this German soldier in a POW camp looking at the horror of what he didn't know what he was fighting for. And in that moment, he says, not that he found God, but that God found him. And not only did God find him in some kind of ethereal way, but God found Moltmann through the body of Christ. Moltmann talks about this idea that when they were still wearing their wartime uniform, they went to a student Christian movement conference where they were welcomed as brothers in Christ. These Dutch students from Holland said this of them, they told us that Christ was the bridge on which they could cross to us and that without Christ, they would not be talking to us at all. At the end, we all embraced. And for me, it was the hour of liberation. In Moltmann's story, he was confronted with this reality. He was confronted with this sense in which he was bound. And yet, in the midst of his moment of being bound, God sought him, God found him, and he was embraced by God's people. You see, today I want to talk about an idea that I feel like sometimes is a little bit feels played out in the church. That you always think when you come to church, they're going to talk about two things, or at least that's what everybody tells me that I'm going to talk about. We're going to talk about sin and money. That's always seems to be the two topics that when somebody says like, oh my gosh, I invited somebody for the first time to church, or you show up to church, those are the two topics that all of a sudden you get a little sweaty because it always feels like that's what the church talks about. But today I'm just going to talk about one of those, which is sin. It's this idea of Jürgen Moltmann, and he it describes this idea of being inextricably bound that there's no way for him to get out. He describes it like an iron band constricting his heart. He says that in his bound state that God found him. 
that in the dark pit of his soul, he found me. And then that in his freedom, that he was able to then embrace others. It was his hour of liberation. You see, in the 21st century America, the idea of sin isn't super popular. We like to talk about mistakes or mess ups. We'll, we'll talk about maybe even like trauma and like what somebody did to you that caused you to do the thing that you did. And so oftentimes we talk about the separation even. You know, there's certain like psychologists, they say, listen, there's a difference between shame and guilt. You know, shame is I am bad. Guilt says I've done bad. But ultimately we have to deal with this problem. As we look at the world around us, if we don't believe there's such a thing as sin, then there's no such thing as morality. It's only sin, this idea of something that is contrary to the character of God, that gives us some idea of right and wrong in the world. And it's only there that we can then begin to talk about right and wrong based on the character of God. And so we have this idea in the world. And people will say, well, listen, just try to be a good person, to which I would then say, what does that mean? If we're all just a cosmic accident floating around the universe, you know, there's not such thing as like a proton and a neutron, you know, being in opposition to each other in a way that is violent or is that is morally wrong. And so the problem with us walking through a world that just says, be good people without God, is that we all struggle with the sense of, but where does this idea of morality come from? The biblical worldview roots it in the idea of anything that is contrary to God himself. You see, oftentimes we go to different places to talk about sin, but we talk about it in different ways. You know, maybe we talk about it as a diagnosis. Maybe we talk about it as uh, the way that we kind of numb ourselves through life, and we just kind of pretend like there's nothing wrong inside of us. Maybe we go to counselors about it, but ultimately we have to deal with this problem that we see inside of us and outside of us, which is what's the problem with me, and what's the problem with the world? I was recently listening to a podcast, and... Uh, some lady was talking about how she was struggling with, what am I doing in life? You know, and so she goes to all these life coaches, and these life coaches are saying, like, you're the best, you can do it, you can do better. And the problem with that is the moments that we don't, the moments that we should love and we don't, the moments that we should respond in generosity, but we don't. And the problem is, what do we do with the sense that something isn't quite right with us and with the world around us. You see, the word sin, though, feels old. It feels like weighty. It feels irrelevant, maybe even, of like, you know, aren't we beyond talking about that idea of sin? And yet, it's the very idea that Hosea highlights to talk about what the nation of Israel is struggling with, that there's something happening in the nation as they look at the nation around them, and as they look at individuals within them, there's something happening that doesn't seem to be quite right. Maybe you've felt that before. Maybe there's been moments where you've laid awake at night because it wasn't a great day for you. And you look back and you say, you know, there just seems like something just isn't quite clicking. And no matter how many YouTube self-help videos I watch or no matter how many, you know, push-ups I do or pull-ups I do or disciplines or how many times I get up at 5 a.m., there's still something inside of me that feels off. And the Bible points to that and begins to talk to us about this idea of what is happening in these moments. And the idea behind sin is not to just kind of paint with a broad brush, but it's to say, what's actually happening here? A couple of weeks ago, Holly was driving my car, and through no fault of her own, just to put that out there, uh, the car died on the side of the road. And it's one thing for me to be able to go on Life 360 and look at where the car broke down. It's one thing for me to go and say, yeah, that car's not working. It's a whole nother thing for us to actually diagnose the problem to pull up the hood, to plug in the diagnostic tool and say, what is happening here? And the idea behind what Hosea is doing in chapter 8 is he's opening up the hood and he's saying, what's the problem with the nation of Israel? What's the problem maybe a little bit more closer to home? What's the problem with what's happening inside of me? And if we're to diagnose it, can it give clarity to what's happening and to the call of what God wants to do, what God wants to redeem, what God wants to restore and how he does that through Jesus Christ. And so I want to start by opening up the hood, diagnosing some of the things that are happening through the different language that the Bible uses when it comes to this idea of sin, because there's actually a number of different terminologies that it uses that gives us a different picture of the problem. And so Hosea opens up chapter 8, and he says, Put the ram's horn to your mouth, one like an eagle comes against the house of the Lord, <clears throat> because they transgress." My covenant, this idea of transgress is one of the words that the Bible uses for sin. I want you to imagine that you're walking through a field and you look over and there's a no trespassing sign. 
And if you were to hop the fence and trespass, that's what this kind of idea of sin is talking about in the Bible. And the oftentimes, the, the reason why people have no trespassing signs is because there could be danger on the other side. You know, you go over into a rock quarry and you fall down a cliff. Like, that's a problem. That's why they put a fence up to say, don't trespass. And sometimes we think that God is like a heavenly killjoy. You know, he's just up there in heaven like, can't do that. I know it seems fun, but you can't. I know that seems fun, but you can't. When in reality, what God is doing is he's fencing us in and encouraging us to those places of life and vitality and saying, be careful because when you go over this boundary marker, there's danger to be found there. That's the first idea of sin when it comes to scripture is transgress. The second is this. It's rebellion. They say, he transgresses against me and rebel against my law. Now, this idea of rebellion is very interesting. It's actually the idea that you've made a covenant with somebody. Uh, oftentimes, you would see this in the Old Testament in terms of international politics, that there would be a treaty, a covenant signed before them, between them, about how they would be in relationship with each other. And to rebel is to break that covenant. To rebel is the way that we see earlier on as Hosea marries this woman by the name of Gomer. They have a contract with one another, a commitment to one another, and yet she steps out and has an unfaithful relationship outside of the context of the relationship. That's breaking covenant with somebody. That's saying, I'm supposed to be faithful to you. We have some sort of relationship, and yet in the midst of that relationship, I'm choosing to intentionally break our, con our contract, our covenant with one another. One person put it this way, it describes the rupture of trust in relationships, a lack of faithfulness and integrity leading to painful experiences that harm everyone involved. And so what God is saying, that they rebel against him. And so we see yet another term. There's two, a third term that's given for sin. And we see this in verse 11, when Ephraim multiplied his altars for sin, they became altars for sinning. The idea of sin here means to miss the mark. It means that there was a goal for you and me. There was a, an idea of how God created us, a direction that he was calling us to walk. And so each one of us at some point has decided to miss our mark. We've decided to go astray. And so we've decided to go our own way. And the idea behind this is not simply that you accidentally did it, but as one commentator said, he says, the hundreds of examples of the words moral use require because he chose to go the wrong direction. He misses the right path to aim at the wrong one because he deliberately follows the wrong path. That's the idea that you and I over and over again, we've deliberately gone the wrong direction. And if you were to ask the question, what's the direction? What's the goal of humanity? It's that we would live in love toward God and love toward one another. But as we look at our lives, what do we find? But over and over again, the ways that we miss the goal, the, miss the mark of love, over and over again. And so the Bible says that you've missed the mark, the reason why you were made, that you've sinned. Lastly, we see the last kind of lexicon definition given to us, thrown at us, of what this idea of sin is in iniquity. The translation of the CSB says, now he will remember their guilt and punish their sins. The CSB translated as guilt. Another way would be iniquity. The idea is that something that was supposed to be straight has become crooked. There's actually these moments in the Bible where somebody is walking along and it says that their back has actually become bent over time. And the idea is that in our iniquity, in our guilt, that we call right wrong and wrong right. And that as we look at the world around us, we see this brokenness, this crookedness to it, that instead of being upright in the way that we are called to be, we become warped and twisted in our being. There's a moral distortion happening. There's a boundary crossing, a covenant betrayal, failure to love, moral distortion. And if you're anything like me, you start to go like, wow, this is heavy stuff. It's like Jürgen Moltmann in this camp wrestling with the idea of who he is and what he's done. Being confronted with the reality of the world around him. We are all bound to this idea. And maybe you're saying, well, you know, the world isn't all that bad. You know, how could this actually play itself out in the world? Well, I just kind of wrote down some ideas. So covenant betrayal, the idea that you're supposed to be in relationship with someone and you break that. The church does this. The church does this. We see the Southern Baptist Convention come out with a 200-page document citing 700 cases of failure to address sexual abuse. In the past 70 years, there have been over 200,000 cases of child abuse within the Catholic Church. 
We see this over and over again through non-disclosure agreements. And we look at that and we say that is a covenant that the church was supposed to make with the people who came there to say, we'll care for you, we'll provide for you, we'll show you love. And yet what we find is there's something in our being that cries out and says, that's not right. That's something wrong with the world. We see this idea of covenant betrayal as there's an estimated 1 million abortions in the United States in 2020, according to Pew Research. And we see that there's this idea that when you bring new life into the world, that you're making a covenant with it, that you'll care with it and you'll tend to it and you'll make sure that it's cared for in the world. And yet we see this covenant betrayal. We see that one in five women will experience some sort of assault or attempted assault in their lifetime with half of those being from intimate partners and 40% from acquaintances. And we look at the world around us and say, that's not the way it's supposed to be. There's brokenness in the world. And the reason why is because God's written in our hearts to say that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to walk in covenant betrayal. There's failure to love in the world. As we look at the world around us, we see that there are many who act on their own benefit at the expense of others. I look at 719 million people globally who are living on less than $2.15 a day with children and youth accounting for two-thirds of the world's poverty. Almost 50 million people currently live in slavery right now. In the world around us, there are those living in bonded labor who are unable to pay back the debt that they have taken out at some point, and so they live and oftentimes pull in the rest of their family into this bonded labor. During the COVID crisis, billionaire wealth increased $3.9 trillion, while labor workers lost 3.7 trillion, with the richest 1% of the world owning 46% of the world's wealth. And we look at that and say, there's sin in the world. There's something wrong about what's happening here. And then finally, there's moral distortion as we look at the world around us. We see that the largest prison population, uh, that the US has one of the largest world prison populations with private prison corporations on the rise with $4 billion in revenue. On average, black male offenders receive federal sentences of almost 20% longer than white males committing the same crimes. Black families have one-tenth the median net worth of white families and are half as likely to own their home as a white family. We see that the rich live 10 to 15 years longer than the poor, and we see that women in the U.S. represent 63% of those working at or below minimum wage. And we begin to look at the world around us and say something is broken, something isn't right. And what I can tell you is that every person recognizes there's something wrong with the world. And the reason we have that is because God has placed something in us that says you're called to something more. And I love that Paul does this oftentimes. He'll trap one group of people and then he'll trap another group of people. And so before we just kind of look at the world around us, I wonder if we look at the world in us. And say, have there been moments where we committed, covenanted with somebody to care for them, protect them, look out for them, and have broken that commitment? Have there been moments where over and over again we promised to be faithful to God, and yet over and over again we've fallen short, and over and over again we fall into the same sin over and over? And is there something inside of us that's broken? Is there something inside of us that fails to love? I don't know about you, but for me, love sounds really like fuzzy. It sounds like really nice, like, yeah, like, shouldn't we all just love one another until I walk by somebody in need and I'm too busy or I don't feel like I want to give money and then I just walk by because then love actually costs me something. And I look at that and I say, there's failure to miss the mark at the need around me. Love sees somebody not as other or out there or their problem. Love sees it as my problem. And so often what I find is that it's easy for me to simply walk by instead of walking in love. Moral distortion. Isn't there something within me that's curved in on myself? That so often it's easy for me to think about me, think about number one, think about what you did to me instead of thinking what I've done to you. Isn't it easy to look through the world and recognize that so often I call what is evil good and what is good evil? And I begin to ask myself the question, well, what can I do about this? Isn't that what every self-help book is about? How do you make something crooked straight? And the problem is, if I got me into the problem, I'm not getting me out. If it was my mess to begin with, I'm not working my way out of this thing. If society got ourselves into the problem, we can't get ourselves out. There's an enormity to this problem that as we begin to pause and think about how big this issue is of sin, we begin to say, well, what can we do about it? Moltmann was haunted by his imprisoned state. He said that he was bound by something that felt like iron around him. And so often as we look at 
the videos and pictures of our lives where we've missed the idea of love, where we've perpetuated injustice and unrighteousness, you and I begin to ask ourselves, what can we do to free ourselves from this issue? To which the Bible says, well, nothing. Amen. Uh, no, there's, there's more. Nothing. We can do nothing to free ourselves because we're the ones who bound ourselves. I think sometimes what we do is we just kind of think, well, if I do more, but isn't it like quicksand? Like the more that you struggle against quicksand, the more that it pulls you in, the faster it pulls you in. And how many of us have felt like we promised ourselves to never do it again, but what do we find? But the more that we promise, the more that we try, the more that we do, it just seems to suck us in more. And so if it relies on us, then we're in trouble. You see, it's not about us having enough therapists or enough self-help or enough aura cleansers or enough gemstones that we put around our necks. It's not about enough conferences. There's nothing that we can do to free ourselves from the very problem that we placed ourselves in. And so what do we do? In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says this, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, the message of the gospel isn't get your act together, figure it out, be better, do more. The message of the gospel is that somebody from outside of you broke into this moment to redeem and restore each one of us. It was the moment that you and I were in bondage and there was nothing that we could do. And it wasn't that we found God. It's not that somewhere along the way we were looking for him and somehow, you know, we, we found him. No, the idea is that God found us in the moment when we weren't even looking for him and yet he found us there, which is good news for us. Because I don't know how many of y'all sometimes get into this space where you're like, I don't know, like I feel like I'm lost in my spiritual life and I feel like I walked away from God or I lost God. And the good news is this, that you don't lose God because you never found him. God found you. And the faithful God who found you will continue to find you, will continue to reach out to you, will continue to break into your moment that you needed him at your moment of greatest despair, that that's when he showed up. And what we find is that Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that he himself became sin so that we might have the righteousness of God. As one church father said, he became what we are so that we might become as he is. And the message of the gospel is that all of that has been swallowed up in Jesus Christ. Jesus has come and redeemed and restored. He said, I will give my life as a ransom for many. It is only through Jesus that we can find freedom because through Jesus we have died and we've been made alive. If, if there are moments where you begin to become condemned because of the things that you've done in the past, what you do is you speak to that condemnation and you say, ha, 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 ha. can I tell you there is no more any Matt Labby. It's no longer Matt Labby's life. Rather, I am hidden in Jesus Christ. And against him, there is no condemnation. And against him, there is no shame. And against him, there is no guilt. And my life is hidden with Christ on high. And the gospel says, yes, your conscience and the world might condemn you, but we come to Jesus Christ and he restores you and we're hidden in Christ on high. That's the message of the gospel. You see, where we failed in our covenant faithfulness, God never did. There was a necklace that I got one, one year. I thought it was cool. Uh, and uh, it said on it, it said Semper Fidelis, which means always faithful. And I thought to myself, Matt, if you wear this necklace, then you can always be faithful. It's a reminder of your faithfulness. And how God calls you to be faithful. Can I tell you the number of times that I sinned with that necklace on and what it became was condemnation. That every time I looked at it, I said, you're not faithful. And I realized in that moment, the beauty of the gospel is that there was one who was always faithful. And as I wore that around my neck, I was reminded that my life is not my own anymore, but I belong to Jesus and he is always faithful. And so it became a reminder in the midst of my faithlessness of Christ's faithfulness. The very thing that was condemnation became hope in Jesus Christ, that he was always filled with faithful love. There was never a moment where Jesus did not love perfectly, and so we recognize he never missed the mark of what it meant to be a human in the world. He never missed a moment of love. As a matter of fact, as he was being nailed to a cross, that he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And in that moment, we see the fullness of what love looks like, not that in that moment that he cursed, but in that moment that he blessed. 
And Jesus filled and fulfilled the message of what it meant to be fully human. And in his moral orientation, Jesus would walk into these situations and he would recognize what uprightness looked like. And Jesus never failed in calling evil, evil, and good, good. And so we come to the words of Christ to recognize what does it mean to live in a moral way in the world around us, as Jesus says, and calls us to a new way. And so we recognize that in that moment, all of us have been bound in the same way that Moltmann found himself bound in this kind of camp as he looked at the incredibly horrible things that he did throughout his life. But in that moment, he said, but God found me. And not only did God find me, but then he was met with the embrace of others. And I love this message of the church. Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 11 says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. Can I tell you this has great implications? Because the message of the gospel is not just simply Christ came from outside of you to bless you, which it is, but it also means the spirit dwells in you to renew you and recreate you. So the church is actually called to live in the way that Christ lived. So then now we live in a new way because if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, there's a new way that Christians are called to live. I wonder what it would look like for Christians to live in such a way that they are faithful to their covenant. That they're faithful to the covenant with one another in their marriage to love one another, to serve one another. That instead of saying, what can I get or what can you do for me, that Christians would show up in their marriage and say, how can I serve? How can I love? And that it would not keep a record of wrong, but that we would not keep a record of how many times I fold the laundry or I did the dishes or how many times I apologized first. But in our marriages, that we would always be the first because the spirit of God moves among us and dwells in us. I wonder what it would look like for us to dwell in covenant faithfulness for our Uh, for those that we brought in the world, for our children, that we would recognize that there is a covenant for us to commit to them, to spend time with them, to raise them, to cherish them, to show them in some way the picture of the Father in heaven through us here on earth. I wonder what it would look like for us to recognize that we are in covenant with one another. And the church is a covenant body of believers that God has called you here and that we have a commitment to one another to come. And though I've sinned against you 70 times, Though I do the same thing over and over again, you're like, ah, he didn't get back to me again. Ah, he said a mean thing to me again. Oh, he messed it up again. That in that, that Jesus doesn't say just 70 times. Jesus says 70 times seven that we forgive one another. So there's a covenant faithfulness in this church. That's the body of Christ. There's covenant faithful love that as we recognize that we are called as the church to love the world. I think sometimes we think that God hates the world. You know, that's kind of the way that preachers do it sometimes. They take some passages from Psalms and they're like, God hates sinners. God hates the world. And yet I wonder why Jesus showed up and it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Sometimes the church looks at the world with hatred as if somehow they're putrid and we should somehow cast them out. And yet it's those very places and people that God calls the church to go and to love in a self-sacrificing way. I wonder what it would look like for the world to be loved by the church instead of condemned by the church. I wonder what it would look like for us to stand beside those who are in need instead of casting blame on them and wait for the inbreaking of the kingdom of God as we sit with them and hear their stories and as we welcome God into that moment. I wonder what it would look like instead of us showing up with condemnation to show up with love because the church is called to be the place that shows up in love. Theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in one of his letters, writes of Jesus, and he says, Jesus is the man for others. And he says this, he says, the church is the church only when it exists for others. The church must share in the secular problems of ordinary human life, not dominating, but helping and serving. It must tell men of every calling what it means to live in Christ, to exist for others. And here we recognize that the church is called to be the place that goes into the places of darkness and embraces others in need. If Jesus was the man for others, and if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then we must be the church for others. We must be the church for the world and not exist simply for ourselves. And so we go to the places of brokenness and we welcome with embrace to say, you can be loved, you can be known. And we are those very people who show up and build a bridge to those in need. So often people talk about them out there, and I'm kind of done with the them out there. You know, they're the, they're, they got an agenda. You know, they, those people, they're really, and I just want to stop and just say, whoa, 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 name someone. 
Name a name. Let's talk about names of people that we are living in a self-sacrificial way and saying, I know this person by name. I know the troubles of their heart. I know the things that keep them awake at night. I'm coming alongside of them and I'm loving them. Before we begin to cast condemnation, name a name of someone that you showed up and Jesus showed up through you to somebody else. You see, Jesus shows up and he doesn't see just a crowd. He sees individuals. And so the church, when we show up, we don't just simply say, well, all those people out there, we show up with names, with people that God has called us to love. And so we show up outside of the church as Christ did, as he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And so I wonder what it would look like for the church to give to the world. I wonder what it would look like for us to have redemption and restoration come through the power of Jesus to the church to recognize that Jesus says this in John chapter 13, I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. What? Jesus, you want us to love one another as you have loved us? And he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you give a lot of money to the church, I don't know if anybody's reading their Bibles lately. This is how everybody will know that you love one another. If you show up to a big building with a great rock concert, how the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, the church is supposed to just blow people's minds, to be like, why would you do that? Why, when you have extra money, do you give it to somebody else in need? Why, when somebody is struggling among you, do you show up and give your time and your effort and your life and your energy to help them? Why would you do that? The world looks in and says, why? How could that be possible? And we just simply say, it's because of the Lord. And they look into that and they say, something's different about those people. Those are disciples of Jesus. I hope that they would make note that we've been with Jesus. You see, love doesn't know emotional, sappy, uncostly love in the church. Say like, oh, we love one another because we hang out with each other for a little bit after service and grab a donut and some coffee and we ask each other how that goes. No, no, no. Love means that it's struggle. Love means that we suffer alongside one another. Love means that for some of us, our vocation is to show up in the midst of the dark moments of one another and say, and be the presence of Jesus. And in those moments, that where, that's where Jesus says, that's my church, showing covenant faithfulness to one another, showing love to one another. And it's there that the image of God begins to renewed and be restored to the church, the church that is outward looking to one another, outward looking to the world. And it's there where we begin to finally have a place to then be able to talk about justice and righteousness. It's there where the church does have a duty to stand out and say, listen, there is moral distortion in the world, and we're going to call that out, and we're going to say that is wrong, and we're going to seek to see those things made straight and made right. We have a duty and obligation when we've shown love to show love to the world around us by bringing in justice and righteousness through prayer, yes, but also through what we do to recognize where are the places where things are bent and how can the gospel of Jesus Christ allow those places to be made straight, that he might bring healing and wholeness and forgiveness and goodness to those places of need. And it's there that we begin to see the beauty of what Hosea speaks of. Not simply that we're broken, though we are. And Hosea points to that only insofar that he might be able to point to, and here's how the gospel redeems and restores. Hear how Jesus comes from outside of you to bring hope and restoration. And here's how this Holy Spirit works within you to redeem and restore that which was broken so that the church might experience a picture of the future. Because the church is meant to be not a picture of this present moment, but the church is called to be a picture of asking the question, what does future eternity of the people of God look like? And we ought to see a picture of it here. I can't imagine all of eternity for us to see somebody in need to walk by and be like, boy, I hope somebody helps them out. I can't imagine all of eternity for us to sit and walk by somebody and just kind of leave them and say, well, that, that was their choice. I can't imagine. And so what that means is that you and I are called to embody that in the present moment and not simply called but empowered so that we might experience the beauty of a new life, of a new world, of a new kingdom, not lived according to the way of the world, but according to the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And maybe you're asking, well, what in the world? How do I make this happen? And what I want to say to you is you wait for God to show up and God shows up in crazy ways. And you just simply say, Lord, I recognize my need. I recognize my despair. Can I tell you how many times a week I look at my sinfulness and I say, Lord, what am I supposed to do about this? And he's like, just wait for me to show up and I'll show up in your life. 
Keep going to those places that I promised to show up in your life. Keep reading scripture. Keep praying. Keep being in fellowship with one another. And as we do that together corporately, God breaks in and God's the one who redeems. God's the one who transforms. And he does it through mystery, not through formula. God does it because he's God. And he's a person. And he shows up when he wants to and where he wants to. And in that, we just simply say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. And I love that communion is a picture of this. It's a picture that all of us come to Christ, who is whole. All of us come to this one man, and we ask, what could one man do against so much sin in the world? And we ask that question, yet I love that in the Gospels, don't we see that Jesus, from just a few simple loaves, feeds 5,000. And so it is for the church today, that as those come to him, and as we receive of him, that he feeds the many. And isn't there mystery in communion? We don't know how it works. I mean, there's a lot of theologians who talk about how it works, but ultimately we just kind of say, like, I don't know. Jesus tells us to do it, and we keep doing it. And as we continue to receive the Lord's Supper and receive communion together, he says that he will do something in that, and we come forward in faith, and we do it together, recognizing that we desperately need God to break into the sin of our world, into the sin of our own selves, that he might redeem and restore all things by his power. As he says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so we do that. Would you stand with me? Lord, we uh, ask that we would rejoice once more in the message of the gospel. That we would celebrate the good news that though we were far off, though there was nothing that we could do, though we were trapped and it feels like there were the iron chains that were binding us to our old way of life, that from that you break in, you bring healing, you bring wholeness through Jesus Christ. You find us in the midst of our brokenness and you redeem us and you restore us by your own power and by your own self-giving. And so, Father, I pray that we would cling to Christ alone today. I pray, Lord, that if we've been trying to do any of this on our own, trying to figure this out on our own, trying to discipline ourselves or help ourselves into a new way of life, that we would simply cling to the cross and say, it is all of Jesus, and I cling to him for my redemption, my salvation, the forgiveness of my sins, the renewal of who I am, and that in that, Lord, the gospel might find new life in us. Lord, I pray that the Spirit would bring new life from the inside out. That, Lord, as we cast ourselves upon you over and over again, as we simply say that, Lord, we are those poor in spirit who open up our hands to you and say, Lord, what I cannot do would you do by your spirit, that, Lord, we would find you redeeming us to be people of love, restoring us, that we would delight in doing these things, that we would delight in waiting with the world, that you would break in and that you would show up in people's lives and in their darkness, that, Lord, you would make all things new. And Lord, would you allow us to be a community of faith that we don't simply call this a a building or a weekend experience, that we don't call this just a gathering together of people that are individuals, but we would recognize that here in this space is called to be a space of self-giving, is called to be a place where we model Jesus, is called to be a place where we serve one another and give for one another and sacrifice for one another because it's there that your redemptive reality breaks into the present and enlivens us. And so, Lord, may we wait on you. And may we receive in faith the gift of your son. May we receive by faith the gift of your spirit. And Lord, this recognition that you are doing a work among us. And so Lord, as we receive of communion, we ask that the mystery of faith, of union of the soul with God himself, would become ever more true and real to us. That the mystery of you being taken into ourselves that we might become what you are, would be made ever more real by the message of the gospel. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.